Hello my friends and welcome back to the next episode of the Divide and Conquer Faction Overviews. This week taking on the Dwarves of Arid Lewin and if you hadn't seen, I did a just a post as an update on my channel, just a text based post. Uh, but yeah, this is coming out one day later just because uh, Friday night I had a lot of uh, school project work that had to be done and I got home super late from work. So we are just one day behind schedule and there will also be another a uh, video that will have to be pushed back sometime in uh, early to mid-May because I'm taking a uh, engineering exam. And so that weekend before that exam, I'm not working, I'm not recording, I am just strictly going to be studying to get prepared for that. So that would be whatever weekend it is before May 10th is the day of the test. So I think that's like the 7th or the 6th. There won't be a video, so that's about three weeks away. Um, but there will be a short break at that time. So anyway, going on to the Dwarves of Arid Lewin. Well, this is a very interesting faction in a very safe corner of the world. As we are up here in the northwest, there are no enemies to the north. Um, at the start of the campaign, it is just rebels that you will be fighting, and eventually Angmar to the east. You could, of course, declare war on the High Elves to the south, but it is a very safe starting location uh, but because of that, you do get some interesting scripts, one of which can definitely make the campaign more challenging. Uh, but it's honestly pretty straightforward, even if you do make it harder, just because you have two very nice dwarven settlements that can give you plenty of mining income. And you have a pretty solid, though limited in variety, faction. So we'll go ahead and start off with the starting settlements. So there are three. They are on the screen now. Your capital is Thorin's Halls here in the Blue Mountains. Gahuzanar is just a uh, town that you have between your other two cities. And then Fahamgathol, which actually counts as a fortress. So you have basically a huge city type uh, settlement here in Thorin's Halls. A town, which is tier 2. And then a fortress over here, which you aren't able to upgrade because it is a unique um, settlement model uh, and strategy map model. So... You won't be able to upgrade that, but you pretty much have fully unrestricted um, building capabilities in your two unique settlements, of course, and the same in Gehuzenar once you upgrade it. So that's it for the starting settlements. You can see early on the income is actually fairly nice. At turn two, you got like 7,000 gold and you're making a little bit of gold, not a whole lot, but you can change that very quickly just by getting some mines out. So starting with the uh, generals that you have, uh, where is the list? Hello, can I... Navigate the menus? Do I not? Oh, I want to do this. Sorry, it's been a moment since I've been on Medieval 2. So, Clan Lord Gore is your faction leader. He has a um, special bodyguard of Gabilgathul Guard, a very powerful uh, sword and shield dwarven unit there. We'll talk more about the um, unique units later on. He is your faction leader. Uh, he should have a special ability. Uh, yes, Stubbornness of the Dwarves. He has a Mithril Court... Uh, co Coat, excuse me, Mithril Coat, gives him five extra hit points. It's a fantastic um, ancillary. One of the best, like, items you can actually equip any general with. It'll keep them alive for a long time. Of course, got the Dwarf Traits for extra hit points already. Um, overall, a very solid faction leader, though he does have lower command stars than you typically have with a lot of other faction leaders who might have, like, eight or more. He only has five to start with, five in Acumen, so he can go... You can basically build him either way. You could have him sit in your uh, in your settlements and generate income as a governor, or you could train him to be better in the battlefield. He excels at neither, though I would recommend, um, since you won't be able to get free upkeep on the Kabilgathul Guard, have him go out and be your military leader out in the field, um, and then just get like another generic dwarf to man your capital for additional income. That is Clan Lord Gore. Your uh, faction heir is Clan Harold Grain, who has a bodyguard of Broadbeam Marksmen. These are fantastic crossbows, as you can see from their stats here. Um, he is a bit squishier. He does come with royal armor, so he does have the extra hit point there and two from the shield. Um, there might be a case to actually give him the Mithril Coat, since the bodyguard does not have near the same defense as the Gabilgathul Guard. Though he does still have the Dwarf trait, which will give him, you know, three extra hit points as well. He has a special ability. Again, this is the Stubbornness of the Dwarves. And your last general is Nar, who starts in Gehuzanar. And he is basically the main general of your forces. He should have a, yeah, a retinue here. General of the Blue Mountains gives him extra authority and command. 
Um, they do know Nard does not have any special ability, though he does have a basically a full loadout here. He's got the shield, the helmet, so it's plus four hit points. The coat of males is another two. So he's got six extra hit points from right there, just been those three items. So you can get a lot of powerful hit point boosting items for your generals, and you pretty much never have to worry about them dying as the dwarves. And you'll even get them if you have like the smiths that are made. If you have like a blacksmith or higher, you'll get chances to get pretty much all of these items, which are all fantastic for a general. I, I know these aren't like the biggest part of a campaign, but I'm just always a fan. I, I love the different amount of like traits you can get for all the factions. Um, but you will notice that none of the generals really have fantastic stats. They're all kind of um, averaging here. Clan Herald Green, four command, five acumen. Uh, Nar is the same, four and five, with a little bit uh, less loyalty and less renown, though I can't remember if these two actually really do anything. Um, I can't remember what effects they might even have. I know Acumen is their governing trait and command to help them in battle. I don't remember what Renown and Loyalty do. Loyalty used to just be about if they would stay as a... Like, if they would stay in your faction and resist bribes, but bribes don't exist in Third Age. Uh, and honestly, I can't remember what these two are supposed to do. If you do know, uh, let it down in the comments below. There might have been a time I remembered that, but I, I just can't, like, think of what it could possibly be. Uh, but for sure, Command is... Their ability to lead your troops in battle gives them morale bonuses, and acumen is how well they are in the starting cities. So that is it for your starting settlements and lords. As for military, uh, in Faham Gothel, you do have Erdluin Scouts and Erdluin Pikemen. The Huzanar comes with a unit of Firebeard Warriors, and in Thorin's Halls, you have two units of Dwarven Laborers. So nothing too powerful. Arguably, your best force is here in Faham Gothel. Um, basically, you have Firebird Warriors and a few decent units here, the Scouts and the Pikemen. You can send them east and grab some early Rebel territory. So I'll talk about the nearby Rebel expansion. As you can see, there is nothing to your west. It is just the ocean. There's nothing on the island of... Uh, ooh, I knew the, I knew the name before. Uh, Bull... I'm, I am blanking on the name. I forget the name of this island. It's honestly not too important. But yeah, there's nothing to your west. Uh, to your east, you do have Garth Helegoth. To the south, you have Perth and Loon, Oskelon, Barketa, and Freerost. Um, all of these settlements are decent to expand to, except for Oskelon. This is kind of a garbage region. One of the, honestly, one of the worst in the entire game, in my opinion. I wouldn't recommend going there. Uh, but you do have additional expansion to the south. Under Towers can be nice to hold because it's got the Palantir. And in Buzzard Doom, which is a key location of the Arid Luin campaign that you are going to want to expand to at some point. You could declare war on the elves. You are neutral with them at the beginning. Um, though you will make a ton of money if you control this bay between um, the trade, the resources in these regions, the sea trade that's available, and the extra income you'll get in your capital just by having these trade routes set up. So a lot of money is to be made with the elves. If you ally to them, definitely get trade rights with them. Even if you plan on attacking the elves, I recommend send your diplomat down get trade rights with them, and you're going to see that you're going to make a lot more money. In fact, I might be able just to show this right here how much more you get. Um, I know it's a significant, like, increase. Um, let's hope I can actually get it from the elves here. <laughs> Should have had this ready to go. Okay, so we're going to make 6,800 gold. Thorin's Hulls makes 1,500. If I get trade with Mythlon, let's just throw in... And maybe they'll just take it. Can they just take it? Yeah, perfect. All right. So now we're at 1700 um, so you make additional money, and especially as you build up your marketplaces, you're going to see a lot of income coming from the trade down here. And as the elves improve on their ports and stuff, um, you'll get even more income. One of those sea trades actually goes all the way to Faham Gothel, so definitely get trade with the elves, even if you plan on going to war with them. Um, that's pretty much it for the campaign uh, map in terms of rebel expansion. Outside of that, you do have... The Breland and the Dunedain over here in the center of Eriador and Angmar, your starting enemy to the east. Um, it will take them a little bit of time to get to your front line, so they can quickly move to Freerost, and then if you take Garth Helegoth early, you'll be bordering them fairly early on. But it's pr a pretty straightforward war, because all you do is march your troops due east and fight Angmar, and you can pretty much go straight to their, you know, most troop-productive settlements, Karn, Doom, Ang, Sul, and Govadrain. You have... Pretty much a sheer straight shot to their important settlements, I guess you could say. Um, and then if you go to the south, you can, of course, go into more of Anadwyth. Though, when you take Buzzard Doom, you probably won't be expanding out of Buzzard Doom for its script, which I'll talk about um, shortly here. 
Um, to go into the changes from version 4.6 to 5, there really isn't a lot. Um, the two the two changes that I even thought were kind of worth mentioning is that now if you accept the rings in the ring script, the High Elves will automatically go to war with you. And the other change is that under that side of the script, if you take the rings, um, Bree no longer sends an army to attack you. It is only the Dunedain and the High Elves that will attack you and then later on the Dwarves. So I guess that might as well lead me into speaking about the scripts. So for that, you do have two, one for taking Buzzra Doom down here, and another is the ring script. So the basic rundown for this script is is at around turn 30 you'll be given the choice to either accept the rings or decline them if you accept the rings then around turn 45 you'll get a warning saying that an attack is coming from the high elves uh, and the dunedain so you'll have four turns before the attack to prep your defenses at thorin's halls um from what I can tell in the script, and I haven't done it in a while, but from what I can tell reading the script itself, it would appear that if you control Mithlond and Forlond, there won't be a high elf attack. Um, I can't confirm that, but I think that's what I'm understanding from just reading the script in the files of the game. Um, if someone, if that is not true, just let me know in the comments down below so that way we can have the right information um, on this video and in the comments, because I figured this might as well be a good resource to have a guide and all the, you know, important information that you'll want in the campaign laid out so it's all in one place. Uh, I believe if you take a Numenos and Dead Man Strike, that should stop the um, Dunedain uh, attack, but I, I'm not sure on that one because I remember only seeing the case for having Mithlond and Forlond controlled under Ered Lewin, and that should stop the attack. Um, but then after that, at around turn 65, we'll get a message about the dwarves that were going to attack you. So that is both Erebor and Khazadum. From this point, you have two in-game years or eight turns to re-establish your alliances with Khazadum and with Erebor over here. Uh, so yeah, that's eight turns. So ideally, you'd already have your diplomats in position to get ready for these attacks. And if you can get an alliance that will stop the attacks, if you don't, you will have um, either a combination of Erebor or Cause of Doom or both of their factions attacking both Faham Gothel and Thorin's Hall. So if you want to challenge to stay um, neutral or at war with the other Dwarven factions and you'll have um, to fight some very powerful Dwarven armies in your homeland provinces. Uh, but if you ally with either or both, you will stop their attack. So if you ally with Erebor but not Cause of Doom, you will have to fight the Cause of Doom armies. Uh, if, you er if you ally with Cause of Doom but not Erebor, you have the Erebor armies to fight. And if you ally with both, you won't have to worry about either of their attacks. And that pretty much does it for the accepting of the rings. Additionally, you do get Grinfarn as a general who comes with the units of the Grimborn Reavers, who are a very powerful and aggressive dual sword wielding um, heavily armored dwarven unit if you reject the rings um, you will not have to, you will not get grenfar and you will not get the rings as ancillaries um, you will not end up having to fight any battles against like the high elves or the dunedain you will instead uh, be able to recruit some high elf units being the uh, the lindar mariners which are the javelin unit and high elven ships uh, from your ports um, i believe you get the high elven ships i could be mistaken on that i'm pretty sure you do get the tier one elven boat so you should get the boat and then the mariner so it gives you a bit more of a naval presence though you are a minor presence at that you're not going to be winning really any battles except for it will it will help against ended wife for example having having the elven ships and the mariners but outside of that naval play doesn't see too much use in um divide and conquer unfortunately just just the state of the geography more than anything one thing i've petitioned for is to have the Brandywine River, uh, actually navigable all the way up to the Shire, which just gives you like another option for navigable um, rivers, but uh, uh, who knows if that'll ever happen. The other argument could be to have the one in Tharbat extend all the way up towards Imladris or towards up here in Rudaur, just to give it a little more um, water routes and use for actually having ships, but eh, that's a problem for, you know, another day. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for the um, ring side of the script. Uh, the other unit you will unlock um, is the... I'm going to blank on their name. I, I will have them in the battle map. They are Azagal's Tomb Protectors. They are a two-handed axe-wielding dwarf unit for Ered Lewin. Um, and one of your few armor-piercing choices. You really don't get a whole lot in that regard. Uh, but they do give you a very elite armor-piercing axe unit. 
So, to quickly talk about the Buzzer Doom script, uh, you will notice there is a hefty orc garrison in Buzzer Doom. Nothing too bad, mostly just heavy goblin halberds, infantry, and I believe there's like a unit of trolls or two, and maybe some wargs in this settlement. But it is only half a stack at uh, 10 units here, um, or 11 units, I guess. Taking that, you will have the unique building option, which I can check here in the building browser, uh, for the vaults. So the first here is the crumbled vault. This will just be in the settlement. It has a bit of um, text here. Essentially, there were dwarven riches and treasures hidden um, in the mountain over there. And this is to have an expedition to recover those. So the first building is the first expedition. Completing this will give you 650 gold and extra happiness um, in public order. Um, and that's all it gives you. It's a pretty nice building to have. The second is where things get uh, dangerous, though. When you build the Great Balls of Beleriand, you do get a melee weapon bonus. You do get 1,050 income, more happiness down there, which helps because it is farther from your capital. And you can recruit the Beleriand Honor Guard, who are probably the best pike unit in the entire game. I, it's hard to think of anything that could actually beat them. They are quite powerful. However, when you do this, the... Basically, an army of goblins led by the, like, not the Balrog, but a Balrog will usurp, attack the settlement. They have catapults, so they can instantly attack it. And chances are they will beat your army that you have in Buzzer Doom. It doesn't really, unless you have saved it for late game and you have, like, catapults and elite units here, you will most likely lose Buzzer Doom. But that is to be the point. Uh, because if you lose Buzzra Doom, you will have the ability to send diplomats to Kaza Doom and to Erebor to request assistance from the other dwarven factions in retaking um, Buzzra Doom. So if you succeed with Erebor, you will get an army with a general who's got four units of Dragon Slayers and four units of uh, Blacklock Engineers. And from Kaza Doom, you'll get a general with four units of Kaza Doom Reclaimers and four units of Hithalgir Beast Hunters. So those armies are meant just to be thrown into Buzzer Doom to help you take it and beat the Balrog that spawns in there. You cannot retrain those units, so they are a one-time gift that is non-retrainable. But the implication is that they would probably die as you retake the settlement and fight the Balrog and all the elite goblins that are occupying it. So that's the purpose of those units. If you do manage to keep them alive, you will have some very, very powerful um, allied dwarven units from the other nations. Though, as attrition wears them down, you will eventually reach a point in the campaign where you no longer have them, or you just have them sitting in a fort to keep them alive, because they will eventually, eventually die out. I believe the generals, if I'm not mistaken, have the respective units from each of the factions, so I believe that Erebor 1 will give you the Dragon Slayers as his general, uh, so you at least have a regenerating unit available, and same for the Cause of Doom Reclaimers. So you at least um, have that going on. But that's pretty much it for the script side of things for Arid Lewin. The other thing I guess we could talk about is your um, military recruitment. You just have the barracks, the ranges, and the siege. So your regular barracks will give you Firebeard Warriors, Arid Lewin Militia, and Arid Lewin Pikemen. The guard barracks will unlock the Longbeard Phalanx and the Longbeard Swordsmen. And then getting the army barracks will uh, add the Gabilkathol Guard, regardless of your choice. If you s accept the rings, this will allow you to train Grimborn Reavers. And if you decline the rings, you will get Azagal's Tomb Protectors from the army barracks. The real strength of Arid Luin does come in their pike and shot tactics, which will be shown in the battle side of the video. For the practice range, you have Arid Luin Scouts. And upgrading that to the archery range, you get Broadbeam Marksman and Longbeard Crossbows. Two different crossbow units with... Similar functions as a crossbow, one is heavily armored, um, and the other is more accurate and deadly. So that is the difference that goes on there. Of course, you have the Dwarven Catapult and the Dwarven Ballista. You can go up to the Tier 6 armor, unless you have Cause of Doom, in which case you can actually get Tier 7 armor with the Mithril Mines. Uh, standard Level 3 Master Builders, and everything else is pretty much the same. Pretty much all the factions don't have any restrictions anymore, so I question if it's even really worth it to talk about the different buildings, since it's pretty universal now on what you can and can't uh, build per faction. You do get the banks, which is something that the evil factions don't get, but you get um, as the dwarves. And of course, if you take Gundabad, you can get the hammers of Gundabad, which were talked about in the Erebor video. 
Um, so that's pretty much it. I guess we could also show the mining, um, the mine income you get in Thorin Sol's 480 with the basic tier one mines, 960 plus 200 at tier two, and 1440 plus 275. So you get a lot of mining income, and you'll also notice that your trade income goes up a lot too as you build it in these buildings. The Huzanar can also get mines, not as well as the mountain settlements, but the option is there. Going from 160 plus 125 to 320 here, and then the complex here, 480 plus 275. So you'll probably want to focus on Faham Gothel and Thoritz Halls first with the mines. Here in Faham Gothel, 320, 640, and then 960. So your best mining location by far is Thoritz Halls, followed by Faham Gothel and then Kahuzanar. And I would recommend building the mines in that order. My other recommendations for the campaign for construction is to have Faham Gothel be your recruitment center, which thankfully it already is. All you need to do is get the practice range going, get some uh, blacksmiths rolling, and get the town halls to train your better units. Um, have Thorin's Halls be primarily a, um, what, what would I say, primarily for economy, so mines and trade here. Um, I would also just grab the practice range early on just so you can at least recruit um, extra crossbows in addition to the infantry here and just keep pumping those units out but primarily focus on the income in Thorin's Halls focus on Faham Gothel building uh, for military and Gehuzenar just to kind of support this one I think there's an argument to say you can go either way with it I tend to go with basic military here at least the practice range is my go-to um, and then just go for economy, just because I like to have lots of the crossbows as Arid Lewin and the Pikes will last a long time and you don't need to worry about them dying so much. Um, I'd also say Papgarth Heligoth be like a military place. And then from there, it, you can just kind of go wherever you want in this campaign. Expand into Ariador or ally with them. Take out Angmar or be neutral with them. I believe your victory conditions, yeah, you do need to have... Harn Doom, Kazo Doom West, and Mount Gundabad. Get rid of Moria, Orcs of Gundabad, and the remnants of Angmar. I think there probably should be a case to change that, and I'll probably petition for this change. It should probably just be like whole 30 regions, including Thorin's Halls, um, and probably Mount Gundabad, just because that's a very sacred place for all of the dwarves. But I would eliminate the need to have Karn Doom and Kazo Doom West. This is kind of a I don't really know why Kaza Doom wants to be in there. I guess because the goblins would have it, but if Kaza Doom takes it, why would you want to take it from the other dwarves? So I think that needs to be changed. I would just have it be have Thorin's Halls, have 30 regions, and have Gundabad, just because this is a sacred place for the dwarves. Because if you accept the rings, um, that basically implies neutrality. You're basically accepting a gift from Sauron, and you don't you're basically at a ceasefire with Angmar. You could go back to war with them if you want, or ally with them. It's really how you want to pick it. I think, honestly, like, before I go into the campaign or into the battle map side of things, I think I like the roster of the Dwarves of Ered Lewin. They're a very easy campaign. Like, it's it's very straightforward, and um, they were the first campaign that I started my channel with. So I, I like that because I was like, not many people play Ered Lewin, and I just think it's an interesting start location. What I would like to do at one point is just have a sub mod where you basically just swap Gondor and Ered Lewin and have Ered Lewin start here in Minas Tirith and have to fight off like all these evil nations. And I think that could be pretty fun using a Pike and Shot faction to fight like the swarms and hordes of Mordor and the cavalry and archer swarms of Harad, the Mumakil. I think that would be pretty fun. One thing I'd like to do is just have a sub mod where I just mix around all of the faction start locations or do a capitals only um, mod where each nation only has their capital region and must expand out from there uh, but there's so many there's so many scripts in the way that that could be a little difficult but if anyone wants to take care of that for me and release a sub mod where everyone just has their capitals and the scripts all work out that would be pretty freaking cool in my opinion but yeah we'll go ahead and head on over to the battle map so i'm not just rambling about other things that aren't the faction and welcome to the battle map side of things. So, I have split the faction up a little differently than I normally do. We're going to start with the crossbow units and the general's bodyguard, then talk about the pikemen, and then the regular melee infantry, and also I've got a little anecdotal unit here, which I'll talk about first, the merchant cavalry, since I forgot to mention them in the campaign map. Uh, but you do get merchant cavalry just as a mercenary unit, but they are found all over area doors, so well. I've already talked about them in the Brayland video. They are pretty much a unit you could say is 
very useful and very essential to the Dwarven playstyle because they allow you to chase down routing enemy troops, but they also do decent enough in melee. Kind of lower stats, but they are cavalry, and dwarves typically don't have much in the variety of cavalry. So you do get the merchants quite often as a mercenary unit, and they are very, very useful to have. Since they're your only mounted option, but I figured they were a big enough part of the campaign that they were worth being noted here in the battle map side. So we got the cavalry out of the way. We'll talk about the general and the crossbows. So the general is the Tamun Zahar nobles. These guys are a spear and shield with a crossbow bodyguard. 10 melee, 12 missile attack, 28 total defense. Great against mounts with their spears. Plenty of uh, missiles there to be used. Good range and very high accuracy. Uh, you won't really notice too much coming from the Tamun Zahar nobles in terms of like number of kills or damage output because they are a lower number but the fact that you do get a or like a spear unit that is very hard to kill and can shoot back is nice to have just don't expect them to be carrying the battles for you they will take a long time to really defeat any units with their crossbows but they are a very hard to kill general because they have the crossbow and because they have mostly the heavy armor Good defense skill, good shield, and then they are good against cavalry. So you can't necessarily just charge into them. You kind of need to come at them with, like, armor-piercing infantry or just, like, a lot of infantry and cavalry and kind of swarm them or at least charge them in the back. But they will take a frontal charge with no problems at all. So that's your general's bodyguard. They used to be a two-handed sword dwarf unit, just high attack, but now they have been repurposed, at least as a version 4.5. So, next unit are the Arid Lewin Scouts. These are your kind of general uh, scouting uh, units, I guess you could say. Your early tier archer, um, you know, that outside of Dwarven Travelers as mercenaries. You don't have regular bows, you just have the crossbows. The Arid Lewin Scouts coming through with 4 melee attack, 7 missile, and 11 defense, with 2 of that being a shield. Mostly armor there, so they are pretty resilient to enemy archers. I definitely recommend, just like I said in the campaign side, recruit a lot of these guys. They're going to get a lot of the killing done for your faction, and especially at range. Just a decent crossbow unit all around. Only average accuracy, so they're not, like, amazing at sniping. But being that they are a dwarven crossbow unit, they are very resilient compared to the crossbow units of other factions. So that's all I can really say about the dwarven scouts. Uh, maybe throw them in loose formation um, and help skirmish against the enemy, or just... Keep a bunch of them in a line and watch as your firing lines just slowly, but they can do a lot of burst damage. Like, they'll just massacre the front line of anything, um, and good sustained DPS from these guys. Uh, next up are the Longbeard Crossbows and the Broadbeam Marksmen. I right, basically consider in the same tier. The Longbeard Crossbows have 114 dwarfs per battalion. They're a bit heavily armored. They have 7 melee with 12 missile attack and 18 total total defense, so slightly better shield there. Mostly just in the armor is how they resist enemy missiles, but high accuracy and 165 meter range, so they are just a straight upgrade uh, to the Arid Lewin Scouts, and you will notice that high accuracy and the five more missile attack they have. So if you can get these guys out, you're definitely going to want them over the scouts every time you can recruit them. And typically by the time you get your minds rolling, you can easily form an army like a full stack with plenty of crossbows kind of across the three types there so a great unit to have next to them my favorite crossbow unit in the whole game the broad beam marksman and that is because these guys are absolutely deadly they take the concept of a ranger with the armor of a dwarf and give them a crossbow so they have 190 meter range this is i believe the highest of any crossbow unit in the mod Maybe Saruman's bodyguard might be better, but I don't think they have that much range, and these guys have very high accuracy. They definitely have the highest missile attack at 14, so this is more or less the best crossbow unit in the entire game. Uh, 8 melee attack, 14 missile, 16 total defense. That long range paired with high accuracy means these guys are just absolutely deadly. Their one weakness, however, is against enemy archers, like enemy rangers and those sorts of things. They do only have 8 armor compared to your other dwarven units, so you will fill the effect of enemy counterfire, but you at least have the range and the ability to hide that you should be able to mostly avoid that. Plus, you can combine the merchant cavalry to take care 
of any archers that might try to shoot at your broadbeam marksman, and they will get so many kills. The accuracy, the damage, it, it's incredible seeing a few of these guys firing into an enemy battalion and watching it just melt under a hail of crossbow bolts. So, a very powerful offensive crossbow unit with very good range. Those susceptible to enemy uh, archers and light archers as well, not just the rangers, um, but they make up for it with deadly, um, you know, just outstanding DPS, great accuracy, they are slow, so unlike other rangers, they can't move super fast. They're a little bit better than your regular dwarfs. They move at 100% movement speed because they are relatively lightly armored. Uh, but that's it for the Broadbeam Marksman. We'll now talk about the Pikes because Ered Lewin is very much a Pike and Shot type nation. In fact, pretty much the only, I guess, Pike and Shot nation. Maybe there's an argument for Isengard there, but they got a lot of other tools. In fact, you know, maybe Isengard is pretty similar to Eridloon, but they don't have the variety. Like, you have four crossbow units and three pikes here. So we'll talk about the pikes. First here, the Eridloon pikemen. You can't go wrong with these guys, a 339. The pikes in general are just very, very strong. I, I've talked about them a lot before. Um, Galadirathan, when he still played the mod, he basically gave a rule of thumb, which I agree with, is that you basically triple whatever their attack stat is, and that's more like their actual damage output. Um, they have long range with these spikes, so as long as they can hold their formation, they can attack relatively quickly. The backline units can attack, not just the front line, um, and they can just keep an enemy at bay for a very long time. Even if they get surrounded, because pikes in this mod don't have a secondary weapon, they don't switch to like a short sword and suffer in melee combat. They will just always have this long stick out. Um, and I don't know what it is. I've always noticed that like pikes just seem to be a little more resilient to like archer fire than I feel they really should be. And I, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because in general at these tiers, pikes have better armor, but even with weaker pikes, I've noticed it. So I'm not sure what exactly that is that makes them seem more resilient to arrows than their stats would indicate. It's probably just anecdotal, but I've always felt they're a little tougher than they should be. That's it for the Arid Lowen pikemen behind them. The direct upgrade, the Longbeard Phalanx. So better stats, 5 melee attack compared to the 3 with 16 defense, so... More tankier, better morale, better damage, just a better pike unit. Um, significantly more expensive than the scouts. I think the, or sorry, the pikemen. Uh, the regular pikes, I think, were around 330 for upkeep. And then the phalanxes are, I think, around 4 to 450. Do kind of wish it would say here in the unit card. That would be nice to be able to reference that. Um, they do have an axe on their models, but they don't actually use that. They will stick in pike formation. And then behind them, a special unit. They are your stake-wielding unit. They are the Valerian Honor Guard. So this is a contender, if not the best, um, for the best pike unit in the entire mod. These guys have 10 attack, 30 defense. They are in a perpetual shield wall formation, so they are unable to leave it. They are just always in sphere wall, which, which might give them some weakness, I guess. Or it might not. No, it's not that they're in sphere wall. It's that they can't... They can't run. They are locked to only walking, but they do walk a little bit faster than other units walk because you may notice pikes in general just seem to have a decently fast move animation. But if a unit is running, they'll be faster than the honor guard and they won't be able to really keep up with them. They're just locked at a walking pace. Um, but these guys do everything. They inspire your troops. They are good against mounts because they're pikes. They frighten nearby enemy infantry and they have excellent, excellent morale there. Um, 10 attack, 30 defense, 20 being armor, and 10 in defense skill. And they just look really, really cool, do they not? I'm, I'm a big fan of these guys. Let me put them on the hill, and I can look a little bit closer here. Just always thought they look really, really well done, and I've been a big fan of the weapon. So it's kind of like a pike and like a battle axe at the same time, or maybe like a, like a really long halberd. I've just always thought that was very unique, so... That's it for the pikes. You have three pikes, though typically you'll only have access to two until those are doom. Um, and then you have four crossbow units or three if you discount the Tamun Zahar nobles. Now, for the melee infantry, um, I'm going to talk about them much because we talked about them in Erebor video. You do get the Dwarven Laborers. They're armor-piercing. They are pretty low stats, but they have some utility as both a police unit um, and as a general killer with the armor-piercing effect. But that's all I'll say about them to move on. 
Primarily, you have Arid Lewin Militia, who are your regular sword and shield unit. 7 attack, 13 defense, so a little worse than the Erebor variant. You're not as strong in the melee department as the other dwarves. Uh, but the Arid Lewin Militia do well enough, especially for it being an area door. Uh, they do have shield wall, and I noticed there was some conversation in the Divide and Conquer Discord. Uh, where people were talking about um, kind of shield wall versus like spaghetti line in, in a loose formation. So basically the reason I say that shield wall is great against archer fire is if you don't have that much space and you want to keep your unit cohesion pretty tight, you can do a spaghetti line like this and it'll help you pr be protected from archers better than it would be for you to be in a block formation. Now, obviously, the best defense against arrow fire is just to put your units in a wide, loose formation like this, if I can actually do it on this battle map. I don't know why it's not letting me. Uh, but, but basically, the idea would be to spread out your units like this, but the footprint it takes is massive, so I don't really recommend doing it unless you're going to throw a a unit in the front line with the sole purpose of taking arrow fire and just dying when melee happens because once melee happens you're going to want to be in a tighter formation this just allows your own troops to get basically surrounded like three models might fight one guy here so i think it's a little better shield wall for your infantry if you don't have that much space to use to just throw them in a long spaghetti line to resist against archers that's just something i wanted to talk about within this video um but also it's of course great at pushing into enemy infantry so it's a very versatile um you know ability to have for a unit so that is the arid Lune militia a couple other units with shield wall also the firebeard warriors are your damage dealing infantry one less attack than the uh arid Lune militia at six but it is armor piercing and they do have one a little bit faster move speed at 100 percent compared to the 95 of the militia these guys don't have great defense against archers, but they are relatively fast for a dwarf infantry unit. The armor piercing is very nice to have because you really don't have melee armor piercing outside of these guys. The laborers and a, you know, the Azagal's tomb protectors we'll get to in a little bit here. Most of your armor piercing is going to come from either your catapults and artillery or your crossbows. So you do get a little bit of a variation. Um, and traditionally, in older versions of Divide and Conquer... Um, Arid Lewin was like a Warhammer and regular like archer bow type faction. You had a lot of armor piercing melee units with hammers, and then you had like a you know a decent um, variety of archers with bows. At least like you had the scouts, which were better than dwarven travelers. You could recruit dwarven travelers, and I think there was one other generic archer unit so you didn't have armor piercing in the missile department but you had a lot of melee armor piercing these guys kind of retain that identity a little bit since they use dual hammers or dual axes or a combination of the both so like this guy has two hammers this guy has two axes this guy has an axe and a hammer so there's a lot of a lot of variety in these guys and i really i really like that about these dwarves and i really appreciate that i just think they're i just think they're neat they're cool dwarves aren't they Next up, we have the Longbeard Swordsman. So, the melee equivalent of the Longbeard Phalanx. Just a direct upgrade to the Arid Loon Militia, going to 9 attack and 20 defense. So, very respectable stats. I guess you could compare these guys to, like, maybe the King's Warriors of Erebor. Though, King's Warriors are going to be better than the Longbeard Swordsman. They have better defense and probably around the same attack, give or take. Uh, but yeah, your melee department is typically weaker than the other two dwarves, but you make it up for the pikes and the crossbows. So, not a whole lot I can say against these guys. They're nice to have. Um, they're better than the regular militia if you can afford them, and they have shield wall also. And now I'll go into the last three melee infantry. So first of all, the Gabilgathol Guard. Basically, this is just tier three in the series of sword and shield dwarf units. They also have shield wall, 114 men. They are 10 attack, 31 defense. I think comparing them to Iron Guard, I think Iron Guard have like 32 defense and 10 attack or 11 attack. So they're basically just around the same or just slightly worse versions of the Iron Guard. But they're still quite potent and very strong in area door. There's not a whole lot that's really going to stand up to these guys. I do think they visually have some of the best looking armor in the mod. I'm a big fan of the square shields and the swords that they use. And I'm just a big fan of the way that the armor looks on these guys. So just a cool unit to have. They used to be like the Gabilgathol Hammer Guard or something like that. In earlier versions, they were like a golden armored unit. And they had Warhammers, which was pretty nice. That was in the days when Erdluin was all hammer-based. And 
you can kind of still see that in their their um faction logo now that i notice that you do have the hammer as your faction symbol though that identity is you know a relic of an older bygone era now i you might want to just put a crossbow there instead but yeah that is the cabelgothol guard available anywhere with the tier 3 barracks now these next two units are where the divide happens if you accept or reject the ring. So we'll talk about the Grimborn Reavers. If you accept the rings, you will unlock these guys in your tier 3 barracks. 15 attack, 26 defense. They cause fear to nearby enemy infantry. And this whole this whole tier, um, they all have locked morale. So none of them are going to run away from combat. If you want a very aggressive melee unit and you like the idea of taking the rings, you'll be rewarded with these guys. They do throw a little bit of their defense away at only 26, but they are absolute, like, meat grinders. They are whirling, twirling blades of dwarven death when you throw them into, like, the front line. They can do a lot of damage. They fight to the last man and are quite nice to have. They kind of take on the tone of a darker dwarf here. Though they are not armor-piercing, they're just dual-wielding with the sword, so... I'm not going to do super great against very high armored units, but they are still very skilled combatants. And their defense does leave them vulnerable to enemy archers, enemy arrows, um, and other skilled armor-piercing um, enemy infantry that you really won't have to worry about too much with those guys. The other unit, if you take the, or if you reject the rings, will be the Azagal's Tomb Protectors, giving you an elite armor-piercing unit with 9 melee attack, 7 charge, and 25 total defense. Kind of the opposite of the Grimborn Rivers in that they inspire your troops instead of causing fear to the enemy, so they'll keep your troops fighting a little longer, which it honestly probably isn't ever going to be a factor because the dwarves have high morale anyway. But maybe your general dies and it's a very tight battle. Um, bring your army near the Azagal's Tomb Protectors, and they'll keep them fighting um, in that kind of scenario. I would say the fear effect is better from the Grimward Reavers, because you can, if they're in combat, fearing an enemy unit and merchant cavalry charge into them, that unit's probably going to rout, unless it's very high, high morale. You know, they have lower attack by six points than the Reavers, but they are armor piercing. So, against units that have 12 or more armor they are more efficient at doing damage than the grimborn reavers because the armor piercing basically takes away half of a unit's armor so i think with 12 or more armor the azagal's tomb protectors are going to be better against which includes to my knowledge the high tier sindar and eldar runway elven units um like arthodyne knights and arthodyne foot or not the footmen but the foot knights and the arthodyne royal knights some of Angmar's roster, like I believe the generals have more than 12 armor, if I'm remembering correctly. So there is some use for these guys. And if you decide that you want to fight the other dwarves, well, this is probably one of your better units. Though they're not as good as, say, the axemen that come from Erebor. So you don't have any direct melee unit that's better than the Khazad Doom or Erebor variants, except for really the Balerian Honor Guard. Um, but for your other infantry, you are a little worse in the melee department. But Arid Luin makes it up with their variety, um, and the, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, you have, you have a lot of crossbows, a lot of ranged options, and a lot of pikes. So, um, you probably won't get into the battle, because the AI always deploys really far here. But to show the next faction that I will do, um, next week, as long as I can keep things on time, you can probably tell who they are already. They are the Goblins of Moria. So they will be next week. I'll talk about them. And then I think it's Gundabad would be next after them. So Goblins of Moria, Gundabad, and then if I'm doing my alphabet right, I think Khand would be next, and then Khazad Doom, or I guess there's no, there's still Gondor to do. Goblins, Gondor, Gundabad, uh, and then H's in the eyes, and, and so on. So. I have the list somewhere, I just can't remember the alphabet off the top of my head, so. Anyway, that will conclude it for this video of the Dwarves of Erd Luin. Again, I apologize for it being a day late, but sometimes life just kind of gets in the way of things, you know? So, hope you guys are enjoying the mod and enjoying the series of the overviews. I've just been hoping that I can kind of keep these entertaining and keep these worthwhile to watch since Galadirth and stepped down, and I'm glad that they are being, like, noticed and people are looking at the guides, and I'm always, like, really happy to see all the support that everyone gives me. So, until the next one, my friends, farewell.